31-year-old man who admitted to killing victims in his apartment, then dismembering their bodies, may have murdered up to 17 people. A serial killer is on the loose in the Daytona area. Investigators are on the trail of a possible serial killer. A stunning claim from an accused killer awaiting trial in Pennsylvania. And authorities believe they could very well have a serial killer in custody. And they say it may be the work of a serial killer. An accused serial killer in Welcome to another fact-finding, nail-biting, bib-buckling episode of Five Minutes of Murder. The same where I, your host, Danny Longlegs, shed some light on the real monsters of today, that of the serial killer. On this episode, we will be going down under to get a closer look at Australia's own Catherine Knight, a murderer, and more importantly, a cannibal whose spotlight case shocked the entire nation of Australia. So go ahead and throw another shrimp on that Barbie as we brave the drop bears and hop right on in with Five Minutes of Murder. Catherine was born October 24, 1955 in Aberdeen, New South Wales, Australia. Her father, Ken, was an alcoholic who openly used violence, intimidation, and uh, strength to basically rape her mother, Barbara, who got raped up to 10 times a day, causing her to hate men and hate sex and turn that to her family. Catherine also was frequently sexually abused by members of her family, but failed to uh, notify which ones uh, who they were. She was raped over and over again until she was around 11 years old. As she grew older, Catherine seemed normal by all means and by all accountants. She was just basically a pleasant girl. But in response to minor upsets through her life, she would throw these massive violent temper tantrums and nobody could understand why she was doing it. She would react in fits of uncontrollable rage. Then she attended Muss Wellbrook High School. Due to her outbursts and violence, she became a loner and was remembered by her classmates as a bully. Then she left school at 15 years old without having to learn how to read or write. 12 months later, she started in what she referred to as her dream job. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, at her local slaughterhouse. She was quickly promoted to boning and giving her her own set of butcher knives. At home, she hung the knives around her bed and all over the ceiling in which ways that she would say, end quote, I always had them handy if I needed them. Now let's fast forward 20 years. Catherine's mostly uneventful life, not much went on. It's basically filled with failed marriage. She had a kid. All the relationships she had were dysfunctional. And basically they always ended in some sort of erratic behavior or violence. Not very good track record with men. Then in 1995, Catherine Knight met John Pricey Price. He was hard drinking, hard working, you know, which sometimes doesn't always running along with each other. And would soon develop an on and off relationship over a couple of years. The whole relationship was intertwined with violence. Some years they had great years, some years they had bad years. But it can only best be described as dysfunctional. Purely violent and chaotic. She was quite highly strung. She was quite jealous with all of her partners. And she was, at times, was certainly quite vindictive in her actions against those partners. It was now February 28th, 2000, and after a series of violent assaults on John, he finally got fed up with it enough to basically kick Catherine out of his house later that day. That afternoon, Price was talking to his co-workers, and he told them something troubling. Price, he had gone over the road with two beers to see his mate and to tell his mate, mate, if you see my van out the front in the morning when you get up to go to work, call the cops. She's done me in. Now, at 6 a.m. February 29th, 2000, the next morning, Pricey did not arrive at work. His car was still there in his driveway. A co-worker called police to alert them. Actually working at Musselbrook that day and received a phone call at the station from a workmate of uh, Mr. Price's. We got the call from his boss to say that he hadn't come in and somebody had been out there and the ute was still in the driveway and couldn't raise anybody. I knew that he was a hard worker and a reliable man, so it was, was a bit unusual for him not to turn up for work and not to make a phone call. I went up, saw, knocked on the door, uh, didn't get an answer, saw some blood on the door jam. Police arrived at 8 a.m. to find blood on the front door, all over the place on the front door. They immediately went around back and they broke down the back door. And upon entering, what they found was, well, John Price's body, what was left of there, lying on the floor. And directly next to him was a then 49-year-old Kathleen Knight, comatose from taking a large number of sleeping pills. I tried to wake her. She was obviously drugged on something and uh, couldn't wake her properly. She was very groggy. She wasn't responding, um, so we carried her outside and um, put her in the, under, under the back lawn. 
I wasn't sure whether she'd try to kill herself with sleeping pills or whatever, but she certainly wasn't injured in any other way. She had stabbed Price with a butcher knife while he was sleeping. There was uh, blood staining down towards the bedrooms. You could see where I think Mr. Price has gone for the light switch. There's uh, blood staining on the lights. And then as he woke up, basically in horror, he jumped to his feet and he attempted to escape the house. But Kathleen, uh, she made chase and she kept chasing him and chased him down, repeatedly stabbing him, stabbing him over and over again, a total of at least 37 times from what they could tell. Several hours after Price died, Catherine skinned his entire body and then hung his body in the skin on one hook there and on a meat hook or in the kitchen doorway archway, where it basically was draped across the kitchen as a skin pelt, if you will. With Catherine Knight being in custody, forensics began to investigate the entire home. And what they found would show the people of Australia from some time to come. I got a phone call from VKG, which is uh, police radio, telling us there'd been a murder. And I said to the operator, said, well, we're heading out to murder. I said, well, he's been decapitated. We came in through the laundry at the back of the premises, and you get, there's an aroma. And uh, it was quite a uh, oh, macabre thing. It's a, a sweet odour, nice odour, as if your mum's cooking a stew. Walk inside, and one of the first things you see is Mr. Price's uh, skin or pelt hanging from the, the door, from a meat hook. I searched through the, um, the pelt for Mr. Price's genitals. Now, as if the murder and decapitation and skidding of Price, he wasn't enough. There's a meal on the table, for God's sake. There's vegetables, there's gravy, there's his meat, which he's cooked in the oven. If you saw it in a horror movie, you'd almost laugh because it's just so over the top. These are the things those coppers saw that day. And um, these are things that never leave them. Backside, uh, it's, a, it's a big muscle. And she's cut that into five different steaks and she's cooked them. She cooked parts of his body, serving them up with meat. Then she also added baked potatoes, pumpkin, zucchini, cabbage, yellow squash, and gravy. Besides each of the plate, there was a name card for whom she prepared each plate for, all set up in a nice presentation, if you will with the name of each one of John Price's children on it. See, she was preparing to feed body parts of the father unknowingly to his children. Pricey's head, well, that was found in a pot just on the stove boiling down with vegetables and the pot was still warm. The evidence against Kathleen was overwhelming. In the kitchen, there was um, items that had been used. There was a jug with a uh, bloodstained handprint on it. So you collect that, that gets processed further back at the lab. A lot of the items were taken back, like the knives, uh, there's a honing steel. There's also a, um, a sharpening stone. Like we had to get DNA material from all of those. There's a piece of um, cooked meat out on the backyard. So we collected that. Once Kathleen recovered from her attempted, well, her assumed attempted overdose and suicide, now in custody, police would begin to interrogate her. Initially, Kathleen pled not guilty of the charges of murder. But then, for some unknown reason, unknown to everyone, the next morning she changed her complete plea to guilty of all charges. While still blaming Price, of course, for her actions, making him, making her have to kill him because he made that happen. She has a rat cunning that she won't then go on and say, yes, this is why I did it. So she's never given the family piece, you know, about why she did it. She's never been honest about it. You know, she blamed him by saying that he had been violent towards her. On November 9th, 2001, Catherine Knight would be the first Australian woman to be sentenced to life in prison without any chance of parole. And she is now currently detained in Silver Waters Women's Correctional Center. If you would like to write to her, you can, not sure why, but you can, by writing to Silverwater Women's Correctional Center, inmate Catherine Knight. Holker Street, Silver Water, NSW 2128, Australia. Not quite sure why you'd want to do that, but hey, it's your, your thing. Well, there you have it, folks. Catherine Knight, a butcher and a cannibal from the land down under. <laughs> Remember the song? Listen, I hope you enjoyed this episode of 5 Minutes of Murder, as I enjoyed and we enjoyed bringing it to you. And just remember, to always lock your uh, doors and windows, because you never know when your 5 Minutes are going to be up. Peace.